welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. During the question-answer session, please press star 1 on your touchstone phone. Today's conference is being recorded. If anyone has any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I'd like to go ahead and turn today's call over to Tracy Johnson. Mammy may begin. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for today's webinar on persuasive writing. Before we get started, I just want to review a few things about the webinar classroom so that you can get the most out of today's session. So as always, we would invite you to participate in several ways. We have a Q&A feature at the bottom right of your screen. You can submit questions here at any time. If they don't get covered during the presentation, we will queue them up in a formal question and answer session at the end of today's call. Um, similar questions, we're going to try to combine those, so make sure that you listen closely uh, to see if your question has already been answered by um, or asked by someone else. And likewise, if you have technical issues, please let us know those in the Q&A feature as well. We also have the chat feature, which many of you have seen. We encourage you to share tips and resources and other ideas um, about how you have applied today's resources and tips um, in this feature so that other attendees can get to learn those things from each other. Um, but just keep in mind that the chat is live to everyone, so as you're putting in those conversations, they will be visible. If you want to have the documents that are going to be discussed in today's discussion, you can go to the Files doc that's at the bottom of the screen and download those there. And just keep in mind that today's session will be recorded and available for you in the Webinars for VISTAs page on the campus, along with other presentations that we have done throughout the course of the year. All right. So welcome to today's webinar on persuasive writing. I'm Tracy Johnson. I'm your host. I am a VISTA Recruitment Marketing and Outreach Specialist here with CNCS. And assisting me today will be Robin and Suzanne. You will see us in the chat and the Q&A to assist you during today's session and to make sure that you get your questions answered. Now I'm going to turn it over to Robin, who will do today's agenda, as well as introduce our guest speakers. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Tracy. So I'm going to go over our agenda today. We have two portions of today's agenda. The first is going to um, go over personal persuasion um, and how you craft a statement in writing um, that is going to move your audience uh, and persuade people to action. So we have uh, Linda Brown Rivelis who will be with us who has um, a lot of experience out in the field talking with donors, um, corporate um, executives, nonprofit executives on how to persuade them to get uh, the things that you need for your cause. and. In addition to uh, persuasive writing in terms of crafting the statement, the other important part of really creating a, a well-written document is making sure that it's clear and precise. Uh, we all know that when you are reading through a document, no matter how persuasive and how wonderful it is, uh, sometimes if you find two or three typos, you are automatically turned off from that document. So it's really important to not only craft a winning statement and a winning story, but actually proofread um, and make sure that what you're saying is clear to your audience as well. So we're going to have um, Mac McComas and Alice Collinher here who are going to talk about uh, how you can make sure that your writing is both clear and precise. Then we're going to open it up for your questions. There are some great resources for you um, in both crafting and checking your writing and show you some next steps for how you craft a winning piece. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm not sure it's afternoon on the West Coast. I think it still might be morning. But um, it's afternoon here on uh, the Mid-Atlantic region, and it's thundering. So hopefully there's not too much interruption, and you'll be able to hear us all clearly. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, our company has been able to have the privilege of working with CNCS since uh, 98 and dealing with all things um, 
necessary to move community forward, whether it's sustainability or communications or strategic action planning. Uh, so it's, I've been around um, doing this kind of work for 35 years. It's really scary. But let's get going because it, it gets more fun as we go along. So learning objectives are that each of us probably has learned from a tot of three years old on up to the uh, aging teenager on how to get what you want from people who have what you want, you know, i.e. parents, etc. So, and most of us are pretty good about persuasion skills. And what we want to do is take out the scary factor and just simply transfer persuasion, personal persuasion skills, into cause purposes. Um, the other objective is to name the six steps used per person to reach persuasion objectives. Um, and we'll go over those in more detail. And then some quick tips, just like we've been, uh, um, just like Robin said, we want to be able to make sure that you can persuade all you want, but if there's a typo, you know, people get stuck. So we'll definitely touch base with that. So here's a question. Which method, what method is best at persuasion? So you see the face-to-face -face smirk on the left, the written word, and the phone. Um, so which one do you think is the most important aspect? Okay, I'm seeing, oh yeah, almost 100% say face-to-face. -face. And it is best. What, it, what is the figure like if you, 95% of communication is through body language, something like that. So face-to-face -face, um, is preferable. However, you need all three to actually bring persuasion to fruition. Okay, so um, why write? It's it's pretty clear. The um, one of the ones that stands out to me a lot, and I'm I'm sure to um, our friends at CNCS is um, how people persuade others to hire them. So when you're going through this course, you know not only think about obviously the cause you represent and how you can persuade community members to um, support it um, and include them in helping them learn to persuade others to support it. But, you know, what are you going to do next? So a cover letter, a resume is really important, but the cover letter targeted to the audience you're applying for a job with is crucial. Um, and then, obviously, when you when you have a face to face you want to confirm what was just discussed in writing um when you want to encourage leadership action um sometimes it's really wonderful for people to be able to add their written input i have a little question can everybody hear me okay Yes, yes, yes. Good. All right. So moving on. So why do we write? We've already talked about you need all three to be specific um, to, to make the impact you want. The ident Identify your audience. Okay. Um, sometimes we want to say the same message to everybody, and you have to know who everybody is. So as we see here, these are folks who... Colleagues, volunteers, supervisors, leadership, you know, how do you manage up? How do you persuade them? Um, media, obviously current donors, prospective donors, partners, and others. Um, so identifying your audience, um, you've done that. 
And now you're you're actually identifying their degree of awareness. Some people just may not have even heard of your cause, um, may not even know you. Uh, then again, they could be very much involved. So you start where your audience is. You incorporate the knowledge you know about about those people we just looked at. Like, if you've got a boss who uh, plays golf uh, fairly regularly or she's, you know, a racquetball fiend or whatever, um, that, that's important information because... You can always use that in your persuasive um, opportunities. You know, and and the best time to, to contact people, what's the best time of day? You know, probably the worst time of day to, to try to contact people is on Monday morning, <laughs> just because everybody's blurry-eyed. Um, and also, if, if your audience is um, the type that likes face-to-face, um uh we have uh, uh um, uh different clients who really really hate email i mean really and only way she really wants to talk to me is on the telephone so so you always need to uh take in mind awareness uh preferences of lifestyle best time period to contact people in the type of contact i'm sure there's other things you can think of but this is at least an introduction to persuasion um, so, these elements apply to both personal and cause-related persuasion work. Uh, we're going to go into each in more detail. I'll just say the words. First is, um, sometimes people want to put the need before the relationship. I would encourage you to be thinking right now of... Um, people in your organization who already have a relationship. Um, They love the cause, and even better, they love you. As you can see, it's it's really hard to say yes to someone that people don't like. So So we got a couple of smiling faces here. Relationship is key. Um, And then... To take that relationship, that donor, and look at the needs you have in your organization. And there are multiple needs. There's never just one. Uh, sometimes I think non, the nonprofit sector says, I have this need and I'm going to ram it down everybody's throat. So they respond to it. People, Some people just, that's not what drives their boat. So to be able to identify a a precise need um, that uh, you can define and clearly convey is, is key. And, we're, and um, um, Mac and Alice are going to be going over that later. Manner. The manner that causes people to, to feel um, like they want to respond, okay? And then the next one is the motivation factor. So they want to respond because, I don't know, you you have this great manner about you. You're natural. The, the cause you're asking for persuading people to respond to is um, outside of your personal needs. It's for, it's for the community. So people who are motivated want to assist, and all they need is a little push. And so that would be the the uh, follow through. So with the behavior to address your needs. So if, in other words, we want to make it easy for people who are motivated to give us support. Um, that's why in direct mail, I'm sure everybody knows what direct mail is. Um, that's all that mail you get in the uh, uh, at home saying, give to me, give to me, give to me. The reason we keep getting all of that is because it keeps working. But what you will see in every uh, written direct mail piece is there's always a reply card, and that makes it easy for people to give to you. People then will want to follow through with 
being motivated to support you. And it's a reward for everybody. And you got thumbs up and happy people. So I want to give you an example of um, a personal persuasion, and you probably have ideas in your head where you scored so well in managing up your you know, with your parents and getting what you wanted and, and how you did it. And you might also think of how they might have um, gotten something from you and how they persuaded you to do something. All right. Anyway, this is just a short um, example. Here's an aunt and a nephew. They have a very special bond. They have a strong relationship. The aunt manages to sprain her ankle, and at the same time, she's got company has uh, just called and said, we're coming a day early, and they're coming like 10 o'clock the next morning. She needs the lawn mowed immediately, so that, and she can't do it, so that's her need. Um, so she knows her nephew has a uh, lawn business in the summer, and she she knows he's very busy, and she knows the best time to call him is at high noon because that's when it's just way too hot to, to do any work. So she's very careful about approaching him, even though they have this strong relationship and like each other, love each other not a lot. She's very respectful. She's also um, respectful in asking him to put her need first in offering to pay, you know? And 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 sometimes and because she has that relationship, when he when there's a pause in the conversation and she says, Listen, I want to pay you a rush uh amount of money to do this and he pauses, then to be fun and say, Oh, and I'll also make your favorite dessert you know, so so there's there's a lightness of being. She's showing respect. She's showing that she knows him and how valuable she is to him by saying, I'll make your favorite dessert. Anyway, so nephew comes that night, mows the lawn. Everything ends well. She's got a manicured lawn. The nephew has happy taste buds. And a deeper relationship is formed. Okay. So I h- hope everybody had the opportunity to download the worksheet on cause persuasion. And you'll see at the very um, the first third of the page that there are the six steps. Um, so I'm going to give you an actual real-life example of work um we've done here in Maryland. Um, So if you look at the chart below, you'll see them listed. Relationship, need, manner, motivation, follow-through, reward. Be thinking as I'm talking of a relationship and start filling in um, how you might go at persuading this person. Okay. We have a special relationship with Annie E. Casey Foundation here in Baltimore, Maryland. As you know, they are national. The founder was, um, uh, this is his mother's name, and uh, he, he founded a UPS. Their focus is on kids. I knew, and this is where relationship comes in, I knew Casey Burton from working in fundraising for years and years, and he had held a number of corporate giving um, offices for different organizations. And I I was glad to have been able to help him get a job at the Casey Foundation. You know, sort of one of those things, time to collect. Okay, so that's the relationship. We looked around at our community and said, children thrive when they're in homes that are stable, okay? We looked around the community, and it, 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 the community in which we live, um, 
looked very, um, it was at a crossroads. It could really begin to take off or it could slip further down. Everything was painted a brown, and it, it's paint that, that um, uh, Bethlehem steel workers brought back home little by little from the job, and that's how they kept their homes uh, painted. They just kept using what they used on ships. Really ugly stuff. Okay, so anyway, so a bunch of people in the community came came to us and said, guys, we want to start a painted ladies contest and we think what that will do when people paint their houses they're committing to stay for a longer period of time in community and besides we can brighten up this place so um i presented this concept to casey burton he sort of rolls his eyes he's like linda that's sort of a kind of convoluted way to help kids. I said, yeah, I know, but it would. It would. And I was able to say how children have, I've seen them grow to infants, now they're in their teens. Uh, So he said, okay, okay, I'm going to try to see if I can advocate for this. So he was motivated to do that. And then, you know, I did some follow through, nice, this is where the phone comes in, just checking in with you, seeing how it's going, what do you think, do you need anything else from me, and anyway, long story short, we got we got the grant, and so the grant funded the contest, so anyway, so how many of you have filled out at least, or should I give you a little time to fill this out on the right-hand column about the persuasion dynamics you would bring regarding your current case. No, just keep going. Okay. <laughs> okay, you got it. You got it. Um, Okie doke. So we'll just keep going. Keep that in mind. And so moving on. I love people. Just keep going. That's great. Okay. All right. So I hope people have a feel for how important persuasion is because uh, you need you need to be able to set the relationship, state the need clearly, um, figure out how you're going to motivate somebody, um, and 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 follow you know follow through and hopefully get that reward. And like like we said at the beginning, um, you know, a missing word or that type of thing, you want someone to be able to read your recap of a face-to-face conversation. You want someone to be able to um, remember that face-to-face conversation without any pause. So our goal is to help people just breeze through your your um, writing. So here's some tips. And you're going to hear these tips said, the same tips said many different ways because we're all wanting to just drum the point home. Write as if you were conversing face to face with your donor. You know, we are, uh, 90% of us said, uh, yeah, face-to-face is best. It is. We just need to be able to translate that into the written word. You write from the donor's perspective first. Your, your cause, your organization, they come in second. They, you really need to be engaging that donor. Um, You really, every opportunity you get on every piece of correspondence is to have a thank you. You know, organizations, I'm sure yours may even have a thank you on the outside of the uh, envelope. Well, because you can't say it enough. Uh, Just thank you for opening the envelope. Thank you for not throwing me away, you know. (laughs) So, And you're also going to choose verbs over nouns when possible to keep the reader engrossed. I'm going to give you some um, other visual persuasion. Um, 
in the middle bullet, you'll see I rest lily pads, lily pads for the eyes. In other words, when you're preparing a document, people just glance at things these days. They, they are going to read that first paragraph. Maybe they'll read um, the ask, and they'll read the postscript if you're writing a letter. All of the, if you want them to read more, you need to give them lily pads to rest their eyes. The fonts need to be to accommodate older eyes, um, no smaller than 12. If you have a series in a sentence, list it and use bullets to kind of go down the page. It, it, it again, it helps the eye stay engaged. Um, sentences should be try to make them no longer than two lines. Um, and and you're going to hear about some tools that are that it's going to help you do that kind of thing. Um, Paragraphs should be no longer than 11 lines. And so all you want to do is just be generous to the reader and give them um, white space in different places. All right. Okay, this, this is kind of fun. All right, here, here are my uh, don'ts and do's. Um, this one's fairly recent to me. And emails... I don't know about you, but I've had email lines that stretch the clear across the the screen of the terminal, and then they go back, and then this email line might be like 15 lines long as a paragraph. I I get by the time I finish that first line, I'm trying to find the second line. Anyway, do make the lines five to six inches long. I I don't care if you, you know have to manually go back. That way, at least the reader will maybe read what you want them to read. Um, another is on the back of the communication. That reply card I mentioned earlier, or say you have a raffle ticket and there's nothing on the back of that, there's nothing on the back of the reply card, please put a message there, even if it's something that, you know, re respond today, you know, re motivating people to actions. Thank you. So good to have met you, blah, 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 anything, but use every bit of space you can without crowding. Another piece about um, persuasion in writing is don't make this kind of statement. Help children read better. Need to go into a little more oomph. Your funding support of X dollars means that volunteers can mentor X number of children a X amount increase over last year, resulting in our goal of scores that jump by a grade. You know, it's... It, it, Keep, again, you're trying to motivate. Write in the present tense, um, 300 children were mentored. No, no, we're, we want to see trained volunteers are mentoring. Um, so it's always in the present tense. We don't want to get too grammatical on you, but I hope these examples get to what we're going after. And again, this will be reemphasized later. Sometimes it's also ha nice to have lily pads for the ears. Okay, and then the other is um, don't uh, write this. Uh, every time in our lives, the, the causes we work for, the organizations we work for, the businesses we work for, there's going to be a form of crisis, okay? It's not always smooth sailing, as we know. So... This is an example of what a, an organization could say. To allay any concerns as to why our organization chose the strategy we did, please visit our, web, our website. Okay. Uh, so here's a do. As a valued stakeholder, 
stakeholder, your trust in this organization remains central to our mission. A volunteer will be contacting you soon to receive your input and answer any questions. Um, care to contrast these two? So why did I highlight R and we? And then the other one is you and your, and I actually forgot to highlight you. Um, focus on them. Exactly. We're focusing on the donor. Yeah, and the second one engages the reader more. Yeah, this is a great group. This is fun. All right. Um, oh, and then the other thing is control. Persuasion, in order to do the follow-up, you don't want to say, well, I look forward to hearing from you, because people get busy. You know, you don't want to say, please visit our website, because they're not going to do that. I mean, they're just not. Uh, they have a busy life, and they heard something bad about whatever happened, and that's all they know. But do have contact that person. Do follow up with them personally to say, I'm going to call you in a few days just to see if you have any input, any questions, blah, blah, blah. What, uh, oh, and maybe you can help us hear what other people are saying about this situation in the community. You know, bring that person in um, to um, into your fold. Okay. My God, that was so fast. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed this. Great. Um, so we're going to move. Um, we're going to take a brief moment. If you have any questions for Linda, uh, <laughs> don't uh, please put them in the Q and A, uh, which is right below the chat box. So if you have any questions, and then um, I think Linda, um, we have one question. Uh, so I think people were unclear about what the lily pads were and what an IRS <laughs> lily pad is. So could you clarify that? <laughs> okay, okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm a fisher person, so I'm very much into nature. nature. Um, okay, so picture lily pads on a pond, and you know how frogs rest on a lily pad, you know, before they make another leap? I mean, that's how they 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 get across the water. So by lily pads, I mean... We're giving the eyes of the reader a place to rest before they can, you know, move on to absorb the rest of the content. I hope that helps. <laughs> Great. Um, so another question is, uh, do these rules apply to writing blogs? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, there's always a different style and uh, more casual writing and more... Um, Formal writing, like to a foundation, is going to be a little more formal. Blogs, yeah, you're trying to, especially if a blog, you're at, you're trying to persuade people. Same rules apply. Um, so, Linda, I know this is one you've probably had to deal with a lot, but what if specific requests for formatting, such as font size and a grant proposal, uh, trumps, you know, these yeah. tips and your kind of aesthetic <laughs> values? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. You do what they say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Um what advice do you have for writing on social media platforms uh, like Facebook and Twitter? What advice I have on, okay. Um, you know, it's still, I, I can spend like 10 minutes trying to write a, an entry into Facebook because it's the same care and attention. In fact, what I find um or, or when you're doing tweets, it's it's harder to write shorter, you know, um, because it forces you to be more dynamic in your vocabulary. Uh, in Facebook, I think the same, you know, the same uh, principles apply. Yeah, I think especially with Twitter, when you have such a small format, mm -hmm. really taking the intention to figure out how you're going to invade, it becomes so crucial. In fact, I can even add to that just a little bit. Um, 
A few years ago, I was at the South by Southwest conference in Austin, Texas. Huge, huge, you know, information. You know, I mean, it's just a plethora of of techies down there. And and so there's one woman, and this is probably old news now, but then it was just really cool. She she did tweets in haiku, and that's a whole other story. But that's really tough when you have to do seven lines to five lines or, or whatever. <laughs> that, that That's tough. Okay, another time we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, do you have any tips for making grant writing language a little bit more exciting? Yeah, yes. Um, definitely at the beginning, in the executive summary, use, you know, minimize our and we. Sometimes you need to say that. We do this. This is our our program. This is um but even then you can you can say something like leadership volunteers and staff worked on preparing blah 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 instead of we. I don't know. It just it's just a little more it doesn't close out the person reading. You know, and then if you can involve the word you in, because there is a person who's reading this grant, um, or mention the foundation, mention their name, um, like at least once on a page, so that, because people like to see their name of the place where they work, that, that keeps them involved in the conversation. Um, do you have tips? Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Um, how might somebody? Um, okay, so what do you think of asking foundations for a referral to other foundations that might fund your cause? Well, especially if they funded you before, um, they w- they would probably be very happy to um, give you advice. And again, people love to give advice which is also part of a relationship building. You know, I, I think um, I'm a pushover when, when a bright uh, 20-something says, gosh, gee, I just would really, you know, like to pick your brain about something. I just want, I just keel over and say, okay, when, what, <laughs> where are we eating? You know, so, so it's, it's, again, um, it makes people feel good. We do have some knowledge to share, and 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 you are genuinely, as the person asking, wanting information, but you're also building relationship. It's real smart. Great. So we're going to um, just move on to our other presenter, but we have all of your questions. In fact, um, I will take one last question because we're actually going to address this in our next presentation. Um, So, Mac, I know this is something that um, you're about to talk about. At what reading level do you suggest written materials for public use? Um, Hi, Robin. we would suggest that you aim for a reading grade level of six, um, trying to get there so that you can have as many people as possible understand your writing. Awesome. Thank you. So um, as you just heard, uh, that, Ma- that is Mac, and Mac and Alice are actually going to be presenting uh, today's the second part of today's presentation about clarity and precision. So in Linda's portion, we learned how to craft the content and to really create a good persuasive piece. And what Alice and Mac are going to go over is once you have that piece, what tools can you use to make sure that that piece is uh, grammatically correct, clear to somebody other than you who who's not uh, entrenched every day in the words of your organization, um, and will uh, present the great persuasive statement that you've crafted to the presenter. So I'm going to turn it over to Mac. Thanks, Robin. So um, we know that many VISTAs, not all, but uh, many VISTAs are recent college graduates, and With this in mind, we wanted to start off um, by talking about the differences between academic writing and professional persuasive writing, and uh, basically saying that while there are some similarities, they're really not the same thing. 
So this table here details um, a lot of those main differences. And I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of the very important ones. Um, audience, um, which Linda talked about, um, and academ academic writing, um, that's usually professors, students, other academics, people who are really informed um, on the writing that you're doing. In professional writing, uh, you know, it's very important to know your audience, as Linda mentioned, and can be large companies, stakeholders, and coworkers. Uh, for the purpose in academic writing, you're really trying to demonstrate knowledge and argue your thesis. Uh, whereas in professional writing, you're writing to get things done and make very specific asks. Um, then the content. Um, in academic writing, you're trying to include all information needed to further your thesis. Um, but in professional writing, you're trying to only say uh, what the audience needs to know. If the details are pertinent, include them, but you don't want to bog them down in unnecessary stuff. Uh, and finally, the style in academic writing is really long, complex paragraphs that explain uh, thoughts. Whereas in professional writing, you want to keep it as short as possible, you want to use simple sentences, and you want to suggest action. Now I'm going to hand it over to Alice to talk about writing for different formats. Thank you, Mac. Uh, so as Mac said, I'm going to start with some tips for writing for specific formats. And I've listed a few on the PowerPoint, but please feel free to list some of the formats that you use the most in the chat feature. So let's start with emails. Most of us write emails every day, but it, so you might think, why do I need tips for writing these when I write them all the time? However, it's important to approach professional emails slightly differently than your personal ones. Firstly, you're often going to be addressing business emails to people who are extremely busy. People get hundreds of emails a day, and if they're taking time out of their day to read yours, you really want to make it easy on them and make, it, uh, make your email concise, as concise as possible. Also, you need to be clear, um, and you especially want to be clear about your ask. Um, the ask is any request that you're making to the person that you're writing to. And you want to get to that ask as quickly as possible. So you'll often want to mention it in the first two sentences. You can then choose to reiterate it at the end of your email, uh, just to remind them of it. Often it's helpful to do that in just a standalone line right before you sign off. And finally, as Linda mentioned in her presentation, you really can't thank people enough. So I always suggest signing off your professional emails with acknowledgement and thanks. Okay, let's move on to press releases. I know that that's something that a lot of you will be working on. So I'm going to take the opportunity with this to emphasize how important planning is for any kind of writing. So for example, for a press release, you want to start by planning out the details that you're going to include. Um, I've included some questions to prompt those details. So who, what, where, when, and why. So you can list those out, identify those details, see if they're all necessary to, uh, necessary to include in your press release, and then structure and write it around those details. You'll also want to get to the most important details as quickly as possible. So the first two sentences should summarize the essentials, and then in the rest of your release, you're going to be going into the important and hopefully interesting details. Okay, and another one that, we, that I listed was a grant proposal or report. And just as Linda addressed in, the, in her Q&A session, um, grant proposals or reports can be a bit difficult to write because they can be dry and they're hard to make interesting. Uh, but they can also be hard to make clear because you more frequently use technical language in a grant proposal. And sometimes when you're using that kind of language, it's easy to fall into using complex language elsewhere when it's not necessary. So you have to be careful about your structure, think it out, again, planning is very important, and don't be tempted to use complex words for their own sake. Just because you're using technical language doesn't mean that everything else has to be complicated. Finally, let's have a look at the resumes. I know a couple of you mentioned in the chat that you're approaching the end of your Vista service, and so uh, you're probably thinking about your resume at the moment and thinking where you're going to go next. There are, there's lots of advice online for um, writing resumes, but I'm just going to give a couple of tips uh, about how to write them. So firstly, you're going to want to make sure that you're carefully tailoring your resume to a particular job description. 
again, planning is key there. You take the job description, break it down, uh, figure out what skills are mentioned and what skills you have that you uh, can use as uh, evidence for, for those skills, and try and echo their language. That can be really helpful. And finally, you're going to want to pay attention to the order of your resume. Make sure it all flows logically and you're only including pertinent details. Don't you know, keep on writing and include details that are unnecessary. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the buzzword that you'll hear throughout this section of the presentation is clarity. If your writing cannot be understood, if it's unclear, you might as well have written nothing at all. You're essentially handing your reader a blank piece of paper and it's a wasted opportunity for persuasion. So later in, in this section, Mac will be addressing some detailed writing tips through activities, but I'm going to give you three rules of thumb for clarity. Firstly, your writing should be concise. If you ramble on, you'll lose your audience's interest, and they'll also lose track of the point that you're trying to make. Which brings me to my next point. Your writing should be simple and straightforward. Know what you want to say through planning and what you want to achieve, and structure your text to get that point across. And finally, know your audience and write directly to appeal to them. There was some great advice from that from Linda, and you want to make sure that you're really thinking about that as you're planning your writing and that it's really precise and, de and directed at that particular audience. So now I'm going to pass uh, the presentation back over to Mac, and he's going to take you through some writing exercises to really explain all of these points. Thanks, Alice. Um, so here we have a uh, really uh, big chunk of text here um, about a college and that the work they've done uh, around social change, and you know you don't have to read it all, but um, it's basically an example of how not to write uh, in an academic setting. You might think that this is really good; it contains lots of great information, but in a professional setting, it's you know it's long, it's complex, and it contains common errors that prevent your writing from being clear, concise, and straightforward. So. We're going to go through a couple of activities using some online tools that is going to help you uh, improve your writing and make sure that uh, you know you can break something like this down into something that is more digestible. So, uh, word cloud. I'm sure some of you know what a word cloud is, um, but uh, basically, it's a great tool that can um, highlight words that you frequently use in your text and those words that you use most often appear largest, uh, with the smaller words uh, being those that appear less often. So I just took that paragraph, I threw it into an online word cloud generator, in this case it's uh, Wordle, um, and you know you can see some of the words that pop up here large, like uh, innovation, innovative, innovators. You should probably find another word for that. Um, you know, you're going to get words like the, to, in. Those are just, you know, you're going to have to use those to write, so don't worry about those. Um, but uh, what can a word cloud teach us? Um, it teaches us that uh, we can avoid using um, certain words, especially adjectives, if we describe everything as great, then, you know, the strength of that word uh, becomes much less. You can also highlight passive voice. So if you see uh, been or was appearing large, that uh, could be a clue that you're using passive voice, which we'll talk about in more depth uh, later. So now we're going to take uh, that chunk of text and put it into Hemingway app. And um, Hemingway app is an online tool that helps uh, writers improve their text in a couple of ways. Uh, Ernest Hemingway was an author famous for his style, which was short to the point, and void of flowery and language, flowery language and embellishment. So what this tool does is it identifies several ways in which your writing can be made more accessible, concise, and straightforward. And what it does is it highlights adverbs in blue, passive voice in green, and complex words that can be simpler in purple. It also highlights long and hard to read sentences in yellow and red. By simplifying, simplifying these sentences and replacing complicated words, you can improve the readability score, which is on the uh, top right of the screen there, 
And uh, the app suggests that uh, you should aim for a reading level of 10, but as we said earlier, uh, you should really aim for a reading level of 6 to make sure that your writing is accessible for most people. So now we're going to go through uh, each one of those highlighted problems, uh, starting with adverbs. So what is an adverb? An adverb is a word that changes, modifies, or simplifies a verb, adjective, or another adverb. Uh, you should avoid, avoid using them whenever possible to keep your verbs strong. There are going to be some occasions when you know it's unavoidable to get rid of an adverb, um, and you can just uh, keep it in there so you don't lose the meaning of your sentence. Uh, an example when you can take it out is instead of saying the boy ran quickly, you could just say the boy sprinted. Um, and there is a f uh, quote from Stephen King. He says, I believe the road to hell is paved with adverbs, and I will shout it from the rooftops. To put it another way, they're like dandelions. If you have one on your lawn, it looks pretty and unique. If you fail to root it out, however, you find the next day, you find five the next day, 50 the day after that, and then, my brothers and sisters, your lawn is totally and completely covered with dandelions. So here you can see that I've taken out all the adverbs. It's improved the uh, readability grade a little bit. Um, and next, we're going to look at passive voice and get rid of that, all those green highlighted areas. So what is passive voice? Passive voice is a grammatical construction that occurs when the object of a sentence appears as a subject. So that means that something is being done to the subject instead of the subject being doing something to the object. So an example of this would be instead of saying the chicken crossed the road, which is active voice, passive voice would be the road was crossed by the chicken. It's uh, it's really timid, you know, it's not getting to the point, it's not strong writing. So um, it's hard to tell when you're doing it, and this is a uh, uh, Hemingway app is a really good way of highlighting it. So next, we're going to look at um, complex words that can be simpler and um, <coughs> taking those away. Uh, Hemingway app isn't really great for um, highlighting all of those, but it gets it gets a lot of them. Uh, what you really have to ask is, um, you know, are most people going to understand what I'm saying here, and then try to reach that uh, level. And finally, we're going to talk about um, reducing uh, complex and long and hard to read sentences and breaking them down into uh, shorter paragraphs. Mark Twain said, employ a simple and straightforward style. So try to break down run-on sentences into their component parts. Uh, separate your writing into short paragraphs that get to the point. Don't try to cram everything into one run-on sentence when you can easily separate it into two or three sentences. So what we're left with here is a very pared-down paragraph. It's uh, broken up into several paragraphs now which speak about uh, different individual parts. And there are shorter sentences which prevent the reader from getting lost and misunderstanding your writing. So what are some takeaways from the Hemingway app? Um, it's a really great tool if you have um, a couple of paragraphs or just a couple of sentences, and you want to make sure that you're um, being aware of adverbs, you want to be sure that you're using the active voice and not the passive voice, and that you don't have long and difficult to read sentences, uh, especially those with multiple clauses. Okay, now I'm going to hand it over to Alice, who is going to talk about proofreading. Thank you, Mac. So to finish off our section of the presentation, I'd like to address the final step of your writing process, proofreading. This is an essential step. So I have a few tips uh, for how best to proofread. So firstly, it can be helpful to step away from your writing before proofreading. Sometimes when you've been staring at something on your screen for too long, you can no longer see the errors. Um, and so if you take some time away, it can be a lot easier to find them. So for an email, I'll sometimes look at something else for a couple of minutes, you know, close the email screen. Um, or for a longer piece, like a report, I'll try and um, structure my writing time so that I'll have a a longer break 
So I might try and work on it in the afternoon, go home, not think about it, and come back in the morning and reread it. It can also be really helpful to ask someone else to proofread your document, and they'll almost always catch something that you've missed. Mac and I will actually often do that for each other, and we'll get into a bit of a competition about who can find the most typos in the other's work. Um, different people have different ways of proofreading as well, and I see that uh, with how each of us approach, uh, approaches our proofreading. So my personal technique is to print out an important document and just go over it with a red pen. Somehow taking it away from my computer screen and bringing it into a different format really helped me find things that I would have otherwise missed. Although, you know, it is worth saying that for longer documents, that's not the most eco-friendly option. So when I'm actually going over the document, I'll go over it sentence by sentence and ask myself for each sentence, is this clear? Could it be simpler? Is it necessary at all? And I'll go through the whole document like that. Um, and one of my favorite tools for uh, working on individual sentences is Grammar Girl's editing checklist. And we'll be including that in our resources section at the end of the presentation so that you'll all be able to check it out. Um, it's a checklist that includes some of the most frequent grammatical mistakes to look for as you proofread. And you can just check over your text for each of those. And it's, yeah, it's just a really helpful tool. Grammar Girl in general is a great resource, actually. You know, if you're ever reading over a sentence and it just sounds slightly off, um, that's a bit of a tip that there might be something grammatically wrong with it. And so in those situations, I'll go to Grammar Girl, put in whatever the issue is, and she just has really great explanations. Um, my final step is to always to, uh, to remember to run a spell checker. Uh, now, I know, I know a lot of documents do this automatically, but just double check that you've done that. It's a really simple step that can help prevent embarrassing mistakes. Although it's worth remembering that it's not foolproof. It can, you know, um, not catch words that are spelt right for one kind of word, but they're not actually the word that you're trying to use yourself. And for me, when I'm going through them, I'm always double checking to make sure that I haven't used the English spelling. So that's an extra spell checker step I have to take, which won't apply to most of you. Okay, I'm now going to, uh, on that note, pass the presentation back over to Robin, uh, who's going to go over some next steps. Back to you, Robin. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, so we have a couple of next uh, steps. So just uh, showing you how you can kind of use everything that you've talked in the presentation today to begin crafting your first piece. So step one is to, uh, when you're crafting, is to always identify your audience and goals. Um, this is probably a good thing for any form of communication, not just writing. Um, so, and then use the worksheet, uh, which again, Linda uh, so wonderfully started with the relationship. So identifying that audience first and using the worksheet to then outline from there those six elements of having a persuasive message. Um, once you do that, then you're ready to craft whatever it is, your proposal, your email, your resume, et cetera, um, from that worksheet. And then once you have that, that's when you go back and you use the Word Cloud and the Hemingway app to ensure that uh, your content is precise. Uh, and then finally, make sure that you spend time proofreading. And I know Alice is going to include, and at the end of this webinar, we're going to include the Grammar Girl um, checklist, but I always recommend having some sort of checklist for whatever work that you have because sometimes if you're just relying on your own kind of mental map, um, it's imperfect. And so for everything from our webinar slides to every email we send out, we have a checklist that makes sure that we're avoiding common mistakes. So um, with that, we're now going to turn it back over. Oh, actually, we have one last kind of slide, and that's just to remind you with these next steps that while this webinar is the end of our presentation, um, it's just the beginning of your path to writing and your uh, VISTA service. And so to remember that uh, there are obviously resources here that we'll post at the end of the webinar, uh, that there we have an email at the webinar, so if you have questions afterwards, um, and then to also remember um, to continue to grow and use resources like the webinar and the VISTA campus uh, to continue on. So with that, I'm going to um, pass it over to um, the team again, and we're going to start asking some of your questions. So 
first, um, can I, we have the operator come on and um, instruct us how to give questions via the phone? Thank you. We will now begin the question answer session. If you'd like to ask a question on the phone, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. Your name is required to introduce your question. Again, if you'd like Thank to ask you. a question on the phone, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name. To withdraw your question, press star 2. One moment, please, for the first question over the phone. Great. So uh, while we're waiting for that, we're going to take questions over the um, over the Adobe Connect. So our first question is, um, do you have any tips for writing other people's stories? Excuse me, hold Yes. Um, Linda, do you want to take that question? Sure, sure. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd love to know where uh, Bridget is coming from on this on this question. Um, tips on writing other stories. Um, I think someone from the audience said a photograph. You know, the picture says a thousand words. Um, that's a fantastic piece. Um, I I would also urge other people to pipe up with answers themselves, um, things that you've done that was particularly compelling. Um, I've done some work in, for instance, telling other stories like writing, say, a direct mail piece, which 85% of all giving in the United States comes from individuals. Corporations are about another 10%. Foundations are about another 10%. I mean, you know, so so writing that letter to an individual to be able to have an enclosure, for instance, maybe on, you know, yellow lined paper where the patient or the community member is is telling their story, you, you know, and obviously with their permission, they've allowed that to hand, and it might be in handwriting, you know. So, so you're just always looking for different ways to to get things across. I would here's one bit of advice: as you get direct mail that comes into your home or into your place of work and you see a really good piece that makes you want to open the envelope, save it because they're doing something right that they got you into the envelope. And start looking at at these pieces from a scientific, artistic standpoint, not so much from a giving standpoint, but, wow, this really works. I could, I could use a, um, this example in some of my work. Yeah, and I would also say one of the things that I've done when trying to write other people's stories is to make sure you get about three times the content from that person than that piece you're going to write. Um, because you can use a lot of these same things about considering your audience and um, going up so you know what kind of framework to put the story in. But if you only have a page of information, you have to get a page out there, you don't have a lot of information to be able to kind of flow and manipulate the story into something that's persuasive. Our next question is, um, could a lily pad, you mentioned I lily pads, Linda, uh, could it, for a blog, could that be a picture? Absolutely. I mean, that's huge. Um, I'm so glad you uh, gave that piece of advice. Definitely a photo, a picture, a child's drawing, you know, anything to kind of bring home what your what your message is. Great. Um, do you have any specific tips for appealing to both numbers people who are interested in data and story people who are interested in the personal stories and the results all in the same document? Uh, yes, you have to do both. Um, people actually, studies have shown that people respond emotionally but they're probably um, 
the follow through comes with the facts. So those those everybody has some of both of those. It's just maybe in a larger percentage of one than another person. So in other words, someone could be, you know, a they respond emotionally um on you know, 60% of the time and 40% of the time they're going to want the facts and figures. You know, it's just a question of degree with the type of person. Yeah, you got to get it all in there. Sorry. All right. So at this point, um, I'm going to see uh, Operator, do we have anybody on the phone? I show no questions over the phone. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question on the phone, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name. One moment, please, to see if we have any questions over the phone. Okay, great. So we'll continue to take quick uh, questions from the Q&A. Uh, if you want to answer via the phone, uh, just press star 1. So, um, Linda, another question for you. What factors do you use to determine the amount asked for in a grant proposal? Ah, well, okay. So, getting to know your audience. Remember we were all talking about um, how important that is. That means you've researched the foundation. There's, I mean, Thank goodness for Google, and you get their annual report. You'll see who, usually they list who they funded that year or the year before. Um, sometimes it'll be the, the uh, you know, the, they'll list the range of the gift they gave. And so you begin to get a read on, um, one, what their normal giving pattern is. So <clears throat> you want it to be obviously fit your your needs and then and and you've got this relationship with a funder and then you need to make sure that need um uh, fits their guidelines and and then you you go for it but research is really key um libraries um, if you happen to work for a rich nonprofit, which is sort of an oxymoronic statement, but the Foundation Center is a fabulous source of information. Um, and I think you can get some information online from them, uh, you know, foundationcenter.org or con. I can't remember if it's org or con. Uh, the Foundation Directory, I mean. So definitely that's a big Kahuna. Others include, uh, you know, read the newspaper, get get information that way on on current events. That doesn't get to your amount issue, but there there are many many ways, especially with Google, and especially with the Foundation Center that has it all there, um, where you can pull that information together. And I'll put a quick plug in. There, there is a um, VISTA webinar on the campus and a resource called Researching Grants. And one of the things they cover is how to research foundations. Um, so they have some resources there. Our next question is, how do you think social media uh, platforms fit into overall communication strategy, um, including you know, uh, how to contact your donor or your target audience? Um, they right now, and according to the mixture of uh, audiences that are not native to social media um, and and have had you know had to learn it uh, versus grow up with it, um, we're definitely going to always for probably thirty twenty more years um, to to have the proposal, to have the letter, to have the face-to-face. -face. So I'm just going to address that, that piece. Right now, from what I can see, that's what we have to focus on. Social media is important because if you're not doing it, you look really out of touch. So that's important just, just from a branding standpoint. It's also important because you know, those people who did grow up with social media, they're going to want to see that. Um, so far, like if you look at Giving USA, 
every year the association, an American Association for Fundraising Council, come out with, you know, here are the statistics. Um, social media is, unless it's a disaster, um, is not bringing in, say, the annual operating income that a program needs. Um, but then again, things are changing really fast. Right now we have to do both things. Um, and probably the the emphasis in that is on um, the proposal, the direct mail pieces, um, and then that's backed up with social media as, as a reminder um, to help follow through, to help motivate people to actually send the gift or volunteer or whatever. And I think that's also, Linda, when you were talking about manner and talking about uh, knowing your audience, that there are some people, particularly young people, who might a informal ask via a Facebook message might be the best way to contact them about an ask. So to also think of that as a medium. Um, I know, um, for instance, we had a... Um, board member at one of my organizations who was like uber active on Twitter and if I needed him to look at something I would direct message him on Twitter because I knew I, he was on it all the time and I knew I could get him to check his email if he saw a tweet about it. So sometimes um, knowing what spaces people are a part of can be part of that too. Exactly. All right, so um, Mac, I think this one is for you. What exactly is wrong with using adverbs? Is it just that they add to the word count? Uh, so my big problem, uh, and Stephen King's big problem with adverbs, is that when you start using them, uh, sometimes you use them a lot and over and over again. Um, also, I'd say... A lot of times they are not necessary. So, for example, if you were to say, it is absolutely essential that you do this. Absolutely is not needed there. You can just say, it is essential that you do this. What absolutely does in that sentence is that it weakens the word essential. So it's sort of about getting rid of unnecessary words. I wouldn't say that they are just flat out um, you know, incorrect to use. There are certain times when you should use them, um, but often they are unnecessary and do just add to the word count, and people like them because they think they're being more descriptive, but really they're just being, um, you know, more complicated in their writing. Thanks, Mac. Um, so our next question is, I'm working on securing a sponsorship for a conference, and in my writing, I often use quotes to grab attention. Do you feel like that's a good idea? Linda, do you want to? Sure. Definitely quotes are, are very, very important. And then if you can also put the quotes um, in italics to it's different from the font or bold them. Um, Thank you. And, oh. Robin, we did oh. not hear that response. <laughs> oh. So sorry. That was, that was me, Linda. I just gave a response to the mute button. <laughs> Forgive me. Forgive me. Okay. Yes, quotes are definitely wonderful to use. Um, and if that gets to the stories, too, anything that personalizes the the communication, you know, like we want to write like it's a face-to-face -face piece. So definitely get the um, quotes in. Try to make them stand out from the rest of the copy, even beyond just the quotation marks on either side. You know, put them on their own line, you know, double space. Here's the quote. Here's who said it. Double space. Go to the next paragraph. Um yeah, they're very, very important. Good question. Wonderful. And uh, I'm going to check in at the operator. Do you have anybody on the phone? Yes, we do have a question over the phone. Great. Uh, ja Jasmine Davis, your line is open. Yes, hi. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so my apologies because I got 
Eastern time, so she was with, I say in Illinois, I don't know what time that is. I was, so I got on the phone call. For me, it's 2.17. I got on at 2 o'clock, but I think it was already in progress. So my question to you all was, um, is, is there a, um, a recording of this video, of the phone call, or can I get the information that was given some type of way? Yes, you can. Uh, there will be a recording of this webinar that's usually available. We'll send it out to you, and then it's also available on the VISTA campus about one to two weeks after the webinar. We'll also get after this webinar the PowerPoint presentation and the worksheets and resources that we mentioned here. So you okay. will have that information. Because, oh, I have the worksheet. Because over there is 317, right? Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah, I messed up. Yeah, but I do have the I have the paper that has the um the red handwriting. Uh, you know your yep. need and your uh, that's the only one I have. But I would love the PowerPoint and the copy of today's message. So um, in the file section below the PowerPoint where you see the cause persuasion worksheet, there should also be a one that's called Writing 508 Final PDF. Okay. And that's the PowerPoint presentation if you want to download it. And it will, as I said before, also be emailed to you after this presentation. Thank you. Do we have any um, other questions on the line? I show no further questions over the phone. Great. Thank you. All right. We can continue from the Q&A. Um, Sarah asked, and maybe this is something Mac or Alice um, might want to come in on, uh, what about overusing to be words as um should they be limited Hi, uh thanks robin <clears throat> that is a really great question um i would say that you should try to avoid them um for those that uh don't know to be verbs are stuff like is am are was um so you know, you could say, like, I am tired. Um, that would be, am would be the to be verb. And to avoid them, there are some things you can do. You know, you try to be more descriptive um, and exact in what you're talking about. But, um, you know, if you go down that route, you're obviously going to make your sentences longer. So I would just try to strike a balance um, between... Uh, using to be verbs and not, because um, you do you don't want to just say I am tired. You're not always tired. You know, you'd say I'm tired right now. That would be different. But um, so I, I'd I'd say yes, try to avoid them, but don't um, don't sacrifice uh, making your sentence really really long um, instead of just getting rid of the to be. Great. Um, so we are, our next question is, um, when incomplete sentences are used in PowerPoint presentations, do the statements end in a period? I've been trained to eliminate the period just in case. Hi, Robin. I'll take that one. So that's a great question. Um, it can sometimes be difficult to apply rules correctly in PowerPoint because um, it's not quite the same as you know writing a an document. Um, but I would say for that that I agree with you that for incomplete sentences, I would usually leave off the period. Although an exception to that would be if you're writing a list and you have several bullet points, you can either choose to put a period after all of them or leave the period off for all of them. So really the most important thing that you're looking for there is consistency. Great. Uh, what... Are so Eric, and maybe this is from Eric, and maybe Linda, this might be for you. Um, what are criteria, the criteria for evaluating a persuasive effort? <laughs> um, did you get what you want? You know. Now, that said, sometimes when you do the very best persuasive, you, it, it couldn't have been done any better, and you don't get what you want. What you want to do is have uh, your fallback, you know? Uh, say you have a face-to-face -face with somebody, uh, you're in their office, and they're saying, look, I really believe in your cause, and I just enjoyed our conversation so, so much, but 
the you know profits this year have just been way down. Um, so I'm not going to be able to support you. Boom. Okay. So what's your follow up? Um, because what you're doing is building a relationship. Okay. So your follow up is whatever. Your follow up could be, thank you so much. Can I call you for advice on on this issue? Um, and I won't take much of your time, but I, I would like to be able to, to keep in touch with you and if I need advice on blah, 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 to be able to call you. That person is absolutely going to say yes. So a successful persuasive effort is when you get someone to say yes to something <laughs> um, because you're building a relationship. And as an aside, if you're ever doing a face-to-face, the most important part of that exchange is certainly the ask, which that's a whole other webinar. But the most important part is your walk to the doorway. And what you say then is is the most important thing. Like, by the way, um, my son went to the same college you did, you know, your son did, and they graduated the same year, blah, 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 blah. You know, that's building relationship. Um, So our next question is, um, do you have any tips for contacting people about getting in-kind donations for raffles and silent auctions? Sure. Um, First of all, let's kind of go through it. Who who are the people you first start with? Who are your friends, in at your at your organization, the cause? Who are your friends? Start start there. Then survey your friends to see who do they know. Um, and I we need to get in kind support. Do any of you know anyone at these businesses? Boom, 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 boom. Um, So you're beginning to get, as as a VISTA, the job is to build capacity. So by involving the stakeholders there, past donors, volunteers, and asking them, you know, call a little meeting, serve cookies and juice, something, and say, okay, guys, I, and maybe you just call everybody together to just have, you know, just do a brain dump of uh, people of influence in the com- community and just find out who everybody knows. And someone may say, oh, he's a next-door neighbor of mine, but you know what? I don't see him as, you know, an influential person, but, you know, the guy owns a company, you know? <laughs> so, so... That's where I would start to ask for any kind of support, whether it's in kind or, you know, or board leadership or just I want you to help me do this project or a donation. It's it's pretty much the same thing. Great. Um, so we are five minutes to the top of the hour. Um, we have a couple more questions, but we wanted to um, wrap up and open the evaluation so that those who have to leave can jump off. So I'm going to hand it over to Tracy. All right. Thank you, Robin. And thanks, everyone, for um, the great questions and the great presentation. I think a lot of people were um, able to get some clear tips that they can start using right away. Um, But we just want to make sure that we get an opportunity to get your feedback on how today went because we're always looking to improve our sessions, but more importantly, make sure that you're getting all the tools that you need to be successful throughout the year. So you should see the evaluation pop up on the left side of your screen. We ask that you just take a moment to answer these questions, and um, we'll use your feedback to work on webinars for um, the future. And so if you you have any other suggestions of topics that we can include, this is the time to um, give that information as well. And while you're completing that evaluation, I'll just go over 
the next webinar that we're going to have on July 22nd. This topic came up today. It's about writing um, resumes, and specifically we're talking about re writing resumes for the federal government because, as you know, being a VISTA, you do get non-competitive eligibility, so we want to make sure that you're best prepared to utilize that tool once your VISTA service is complete. Um, this webinar, as well as previous webinars from, to, um, from the VISTA uh, Professional Development Series will be available on the ongoing learning page of the VISTA campus. And so as um, Robin mentioned, look out for this in the upcoming weeks under the Webinars on Demand series. And um, we hope to see you on July 22nd for writing federal resumes. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you so much for participating in today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you and have a great day.